Well, hello everyone. It looks like we're starting. Um, it's wonderful to have everyone here today. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are all meeting on Aboriginal land. Um, I'm here on the Gadigal and Wongal people's land of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today and who we walk alongside in this work each and every day. Um, thank you. And um, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. And thank you for NAPCAN for actually organising this wonderful event today as part of 16 Days of Activism. A uh, special thanks to Lisa, Helen and Ali and her team uh, for spearheading this idea. Um, it's so wonderful to have an event that is focused squarely on primary prevention during 16 days of activism. Um, we know as part of uh, the next national plan deliberations that uh, there is going to be finally an increased focus on primary prevention as well as early intervention to stop violence before it starts um, and to support families earlier. Uh, we know that we have a world leading framework to prevent violence against women and their children. Um, from our watch, Change the Story, which is an updated version that's just come out, um, and Changing the Picture Framework. And we have organisations like NAPCAN leading the way in implementation. Uh, NAPCAN is a huge supporter of community-driven initiatives. And today, um, we have the great pleasure of hearing about three such innovative projects. Um, we will be joined by um, Marika Contellas, um, who's the Training Professional Service Manager right here at Full Stop Foundation. Um, and we've got Dr Astrid Perry, OA, um, OAM, uh, Head of Women, Equity and Domestic Violence at Settlement Services International, as well as Chris Boyle, Founder and Executive Director of Stand By You Foundation. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to go through some of the um, housekeeping. Um, so, uh, if you're not familiar with GoToWebinars, the control panel is on your right hand side um, and you as the audience are in listen only mode, which means you, can, you, can't, um, you can't actually turn on your camera or your microphone. Um, so yep, don't worry about that. Um, in the control panel towards the bottom, you'll see a chat function and that cam will be adding relevant links into the chats as well throughout the session. So you can keep an eye on that. You'll also find some information in the chat that may be helpful if you're having technical issues, so don't uh, hesitate to reach out. The questions and chat function is enabled for questions and we would very much welcome those. Uh, we have hundreds of people online today and limited time, but we will try to get to your questions. Um, so please just keep sending them through um, right throughout the session. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and will be posted on NAPCAN's website um, in due course, along with a resource sheet, including links to information that we have been talking about today. Um, and now for a little bit of background around the, the webinar itself. Um, as you probably know by now, this webinar is being held during the 16 days um, of activism. It's a 16 days of activism um, to eliminate uh, gender-based violence. Uh, this is something that uh, has been growing over time, but this year it, it has never been um, bigger than it is this year, where people from all walks of life and all parts of the community are coming together um, to, to actually do something to end violence against women and their children. We, um, well, everybody, but of course, um, that, that um, in terms of the human rights obligations and the Human Rights Convention with a focus on gender-based violence against women and their children. Uh, we're seeing action from corporates, we're seeing action from business, we're seeing action from uh, the from, from government right across the political spectrum, uh, and most importantly from community, and that's what you're going to hear a little bit more of today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Marika Contellis. Marika works with us at Full Stop Foundation and has over three decades of experience working with people, their families and communities. Um, and today she'll be speaking to us about a very innovative program that we have at Full Stop Australia called Good Night, the Good Night Out campaign, which trains staff in licensed venues to prevent and respond to sexual assault. Welcome, Marika. Well, thank you so much, um, Hayley, and good morning, everyone. Um, what Hayley probably didn't mention, uh, the most important credential is I am a mum of teenagers. Um, teenagers who are just experiencing that going out and staying out all night. Um, I'm the kind of mum that says, yeah, absolutely do it, but hangs out by the window and checks my mobile phone. Oh, it's fabulous you're going out, but of course I'm, I'm learning how to uh, try and stay calm. Um, 
it's 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 an interesting medium talking to people i can't see you as an audience um, but i would really love any comments as i as i just chat through what this good night out program looks like um, Hayley mentioned uh, with excitement um, and positivity that there is a strong recognition that primary prevention um, needs to be supported and it needs to be funded. Uh, what we do know, and certainly what we talk about here at Full Stop Australia is no one has a monopoly on developing, designing and delivering primary prevention no sector, no individual, no organisation. We need a load of different approaches um, to really preventing violence before it happens. We need to understand what works, what doesn't, under, what doesn't work. We need to understand what works in particular contexts and what um, would work better in other contexts. Um, whilst early intervention is criti critical, what we what we know uh, and what we are learning is that primary prevention programs do make a difference. I was very excited to learn about the Good Night Out program when I engaged with Full Stop Australia. And I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard of the Good Night Out program. It would be great if you put something in, in the chat. Um, if you have heard about it and what have you heard, um, and any other questions you might want us to cover off today in this session. It is um, an initiative, it's a global initiative. It, um, Good Night Out or GNO um, is known as a targeted safety initiative um, for the nighttime economy. It was established in, in 2014 and in fact um, one of the women, Bryony, uh, the, who spearheaded the model, worked with um, Full Stop Australia, then known as Rape and Domestic uh, Violence Services Australia. It essentially was an idea to help licensed premises, pubs, clubs, all those places my kids are hanging out in, um, to deal with and tackle and prevent harassment. Because what we know and what the evidence tells us is that harassment is the building block, the foundation. It allows the ecology to bloom that enables violence um, to happen in our communities. We uh, and the Good Night Out program right across the world, England, parts of Europe and in Australia, has partnered with local councils, with police, um, with licensing teams, with businesses, um, and of course with NGOs. Um, we're currently working um, with the City of Melbourne with the Night Justice Project um, and really looking at what, what, what would a good primary prevention program look like and, what, and how can Good Night Out really kind of uh, fit in with that. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Good Night Out, um, starts off with some fundamental beliefs, um, values or principles. First of all, um, this principle of community accountability, no one has a monopoly. Uh, we all have a role to play. No one business can end harassment. Um, it, um, it, it really is all up to us. It's about corporate accountability, um, that businesses um, that take people's money have a duty of care. Um, to professionally um, and, and confidently prevent um, incidents of violence or harassment um, and certainly um, uh, respond when they do occur. Bystander intervention is another um, principle um, that third parties who witness assaults or harassment should feel um, empowered to step forward, that they need the confidence to do that. Um, and then, of course, um, the other key principle is you really need some good uh, policies and processes that say we've got a zero tolerance to this kind of stuff um, and all our staff are well and truly on board. Um, 
And what that equals, what, that, what those beliefs will really deliver, the impact is safer environments and good night out for all. I mean, I, I, I can't see you, um, but certainly um, I imagine we've all gone out <laughs> um, and had a good night out, but we've also probably witnessed um, incidents that really have made the night go, go wrong or potentially could have made the night go wrong. Um, we've probably all witnessed people not really knowing what to do um, and how to behave when things are not going right. And essentially, this program is about enabling those uh, nighttime economy operators to build excellent policy and process that's really easy and um, accessible for them and their teams. Um, we support them to do that. We offer them very accessible, interactive training on site, on location to their staff and their contractors, which include um, their security guards um, and anyone else involved in, in, in that economy, including people who are gigging and supporting bands and music in and around those, um, those licensed premises. Um, we help them with comms, um, being able to display prominently on their, um, in their local premises with some really good posters, as well as some good social media tiles. And we offer ongoing support to those trained venues um, through um, a nominated contact. Um, and in our case, that would be Full, full Stop Australia. What happens when? Who can I refer out to? Um, what would good support look like? So um, the Good Night Out program is, is, I guess, in Australia, really trying to support those licensed premises with their duty of care. It's about engaging um, people who are attending. So it's um, people um, who are going to their pubs and the clubs, um, young people, people of all ages, um, and engaging them in ways that says, you too have a responsibility to ensuring you have a good night out, but also ensuring that others have a good night out. Um, it is also about working with those um, key organisations and licensing bodies to enable them to prevent violence before it happens. It's, um, it's been an interesting road so far, and we've engaged with a number of licensed venues and peak bodies like, for example, um, Support Act, um, which is the peak body for the music industry, um, and really having some robust conversations with those, those people and their stakeholders. And what we are absolutely um, uh, confident about is this motivation across um, our communities, irrespective of what which sectors, this really strong motivation that, hey, we really want to do this. We really want to play a role in ending harassment. We really want to play a role in ensuring violence doesn't happen. Can you can we work together to do this? And I think that's that's the magic bit, that's the gold bit that we're working on. Um, there's information about the Good Night Out program on our website, uh, fullstop.org.au, um, and um, certainly information about the program, um, the evidence base that it comes from, um, if you visit goodnightout.org. Um, and that's, that's pretty much me, a snapshot of the Good Night Out program. So back to you, Hayley. Thanks so much, Marika. Um, so great to hear about, of course, um, it's one of my faves of the projects um, that we've got here running at Full Stop Australia. It's actually really interesting, and maybe just for the audience's benefit, 
as well uh, that I did notice you talking about young people and having teens. Um, I do too. Um, and I think that that's important that we, we think about this too because, I mean, whilst all of us as adults do go out, have fun, and we still see things that um, are concerning and there are still experiences that we have with people that we know around us or that we see, um, actually children under the age of 19, young people under the age of 19 are at the highest risk of both experiencing sexual violence, but also um, experiencing, also using um, behaviours of perpetrating sexual violence as well, which is extremely concerning. Um, and of course, focusing on venues where there, there is alcohol available is really important because we know that uh, whilst being um, intoxicated does not cause uh, predatory behaviour, doesn't cause pe for people to abuse their power um, in relation to, to sexual uh, harassment or sexual violence, um, it does in fact um, often um, coincide and increase that risk. And so um, it's, it's, like it's just incredibly important. And how good is the timing that we're discussing this right now as all of us are so excited to be getting out and about, we're like teenagers ourselves. Um, going out and getting getting out and about. I'm just going to check in my little um, box here from our wonderful NAPCAN organisers if we have any questions. Um, has the program been evaluated? Marika. Yep, yep, thank you. Thanks um, um, to that question. It has had some evaluation and it has had evaluation um, at a local level, it is also looking to be evaluated across the global level. So the, the UK-based leaders of the program are just entering into an evaluation um, uh, program um, with, I think, a university in the UK, so I can't really tell you that, but I can certainly give more information post this. But every program that we de delivered absolutely gets um, evaluated. The Night uh, Justice Project that we're working with at the City of Sydney is being evaluated um, by uh, Monash University um, and has a quite a robust evaluation. That should be available probably this time next year. Awesome. I was going to also, I've got another one here about um, how do you actually get involved with the program? If you wanted to get involved, um, I guess, yeah. as somebody who is, is connected in some way in the community to licensed venues? Um, best ways, um, contact us. Um, we are the licensed um, providers of the Good Night Out program in Australia. And um, so fullstop.org.au um, and um, or 1800 full stop. And um, you'll call me, which is fantastic. I'm happy to put my little um, uh, contact numbers there. but email, uh, but the website will certainly give you the um, access points. Um, another question that's come in is um, how to approach our favourite bar or somewhere our children regularly go? Hmm. How do we approach a favourite bar or somewhere, somewhere our children regularly go? Hmm. I'm not quite sure what that's, that question's going to. Do you have... What do you mean? Do you, maybe, maybe the questioner is asking how do we approach them to be involved? Um, and we've got some collateral around that, um, a very uh, quick, easy, accessible fact sheet. Um, it is a relatively um, cheap program. Of course, license, licensees have to pay, um, but it is, it is definitely financially accessible. The, the biggest um, commitment is getting their team in a room Mm. Um, and so, you know, they could have 30, 40 bar staff and security guards. That's their biggest commitment. Um, or perhaps, you know, getting them on a Zoom, um, which again is um, accessible. So all you would need to do again, thank you to that question, is give me a call. I will share a very um, nice little leaflet that you can just casually put on the, uh, on the pub bar and say, um, or speak to the public and say, this might be really good. And have you done that? Have you done that where your kids are? Like, <laughs> like you're what like, do you think? You know me. What do you think? Okay, well, I'm, I'm down at the I'm down at Newtown all the time whenever I'm allowed to. Um, that's where they hang. Uh, so the Mulder and the Bank have got it. 
Yeah, and you know what else has been really cool is that the workplaces that do it are like, you know, they become like really like into it and they promote it. Like we're a safe place. You can have a good night out here and that sort of thing. And in actual fact, and it's funny because the younger people, um, but particularly women, um, LGBTIQ community, like they know where they they feel safe because actually the proof is in the pudding, right? So I think that's one of the things that I think is most exciting as well. About yeah, and the, I think the evaluation question, yeah, thank you. I think the evaluation um, question is a really good one because what we're seeking to, to show that it's actually good business, mm. um, that having um, your team trained, supported and confident is actually really good business because people will choose um, to go to those venues when they see it feeling safe. So you're absolutely right, Hayley. Um, and whilst we know that, um, we are absolutely seeking to prove it um, through this program. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing a bit about the Good Night Out program. Um, we might come back with some Q&A at the end. Um, and yeah, we're going to move on now to um, the wonderful Dr. Astrid Perry, I am from Settlement Services International. Astrid's work experience spans over 30 years in leadership and multicultural work. Over the past few years, her focus has been on women's affairs and domestic and family violence. And within Settlement Services International, SSI, um, she has led the Women and Girls Strategic Plan to empower the women uh, Settlement Services International work with and achieve greater outcomes for them and their communities. I have um, had the great pleasure of working with Astrid for some time now. I remember going to an event, gosh, it would have been, um, could be close to 10 years ago now where we were looking at um, getting an innovation, a different innovation grant up and running. So um, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're an inspiration. Um, you are a thought leader, Astrid, and it would be, um, yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing about your innovative project, community project, which has got, I guess, prevention, but also an early intervention bent as well. Thank you, Hayley, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I'm here from um, Settlement Services International and uh, those who know us know we are a very big organisation. So I felt uh, we're doing so much work in this space and there's so much food for thought that I thought I could maybe lumber you with a PowerPoint. And as I'm sitting right in the middle, this will give you some eye candy maybe as well. Um, so, and I hope you can see me despite the PowerPoint because that, that sort of will be important or is important to me um, uh, as there is an audience out there. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, Settlement Services just quickly. We are a very large not-for-profit organization with a footprint in, um, in Brisbane and, um, and Melbourne or Queensland and Victoria and New South Wales. Our head office is in New South Wales and that's where we started. So all that I share today with you is New South Wales focus. And um, we have a very wide spread of programs, including from refugee programs, which is sort of our base where we started to foster multicultural foster care, employment programs, um, NDIS disability programs in terms of the LAC. So a very, very broad spread of services and we manage a consortium of 20 settlement providers and I will talk about that a little bit more. Um, so next slide. So I will actually cover some of our programs in this space, um, none of which, which are clearly labelled as primary prevention programs but all that have a component and certainly um, you know contributes to um, preventative kind of conversations, but we all know that that is actually a really hard thing to do with uh, multicultural communities for many reasons, and some of those reasons I'll, I'll, I'll outline. But I will focus on the Building Stronger Families program and the Supporting You program a bit more than the others, but, um, and that's because I've particularly been asked about the Building Stronger Families program, but the others actually provide good opportunities for food for thought and opportunities for you to engage with. Uh, so I don't want to leave them out. So next slide, please. Okay, so the Building Stronger Families, we're in partnership with Relationships Australia. In fact, they are the, the lead um, in, in that they are the contract holder. We've always conceptualized it together because when we started 
for that innovation workshop that first time where I met Hayley, um, you know, we, we recognize that we are not a DV specialist or a men's behavior specialist in any way, but that we were really irked about not having any programs in language and in culture, because that automatically rules out many men from having the opportunity to attend such programs. Um, and part of uh, then the promotion, it's not a prevention program, as you know, men's behavior change program, pretty straightforward in that sense. You know, we follow all the rules, we are accredited as well. But we had to attract the men to join it. And that is where, um, you know, a lot of, lot of conversations went on. So we had a community engagement strategy. We were hoping to get referrals from the multicultural networks. That didn't quite work out and you'll learn soon enough why. Um, and we started with our own staff that were from the language and from the cultural background. And from there, they told us who would be the leaders, who we should talk to, how to go about it, who is important um, and who could have some influence. So we very much used a snowballing type of approach. And then we did a whole lot of promotional activities with flyers and Facebook and um, using community networks extensively. And so we had a lot of conversations and one-on-one -on -one they were quite positive, um, but they didn't necessarily have the flow on effect that we wanted in terms of creating community conversation. And, um, and we were then sort of embracing the mainstream referrers more, so DCJ and, um, and corrective services and so on. And, and the courts, which, which isn't what we had planned. We were hoping that we get mild to moderate men first with, with mild to moderate domestic violence behavior um, because they were new arrivals, potentially newer arrivals, didn't know Australia, but guess what? Uh, they didn't come forward. Uh, so next slide, please. So these are some of our learnings out of that. The risk of reputation is enormous. So many of our leaders didn't want to have that conversation with the men, even though they knew there was something going on because they didn't want to risk to their own reputation. And this applied to some of our multicultural workers as well in the different settlement services. And it was so important that they didn't trade the information, of course, from the partner. Uh, because that would be dangerous for the partner. So most of the time we found that they had conversations with the women, but then couldn't have, you know, the woman would have had to have the conversation with the husband, which she wasn't necessarily wanting to do uh, for good reasons. Um, we realized that our effectiveness of the networks for this purpose wasn't great. So we have extensive multicultural networks uh, with, with many, many providers and workers, but because of that reputational issue, that wasn't actually such an effective network for referrals. The extent of shame is just enormous around domestic and family, family violence because the unit, the family unit is a, is a closed unit, it's private and they, and workers often feel that they shouldn't in any way question that private space. Um, also, some of our workers we found felt sorry um, because they're new arrivals, they get themselves into trouble for not knowing the different culture and how it should be in Australia and that sort of thing. And that, that, that's a very hard thing to break when you're essentially a worker that's about being supportive and then all of a sudden you have to be sort of uh, more cutthroat, I guess, in terms of domestic violence and its dangers. Um, the number one thing is that the, the men that fear gender equality and they fear that they lose control over the family unit. And they see, of course, in their daily lives, some of that loss of control. If they look at other cultures or if they look at Australia in general, or if they look at the loss of power over all the Centrelink accounts and so on and so on. So they have sort of daily examples around how they might lose control. And, um, and so then the question is, what is a safe space to talk about domestic violence? And for settlement workers, this is very much about healthy relationship programs, women support programs. That's when they sort of raise the question. And that's where sort of primary prevention has, uh, has a space. 
So let me get on to one of the other programs because I'm sure you'll have questions later. So next slide, please. So supporting you, we, we brought together a group of women leaders as social responders. So our idea was that, and we know the research says that, that disclosures is most often to family, a friend, uh, maybe a leader. So we particularly looked for women by word of mouth who have a central role in the community. Women that are go-to women if there, if there is a problem, whether that be with school or with systems or with Centrelink or whatever it is. So we actually brought in Sydney together 19 women and they are very active and very strong. And then we, had an, we have another group in Coffs Harbour because Coffs Harbour asked for it and we've got a settlement base there. And there's 14 women in Coffs Harbour that are very active. They have a every three weeks a learning circle where we discuss some of, of these questions. But the interesting thing is, next slide please, is that many of them actually wanted to go for prevention type of activities rather than just um, you know, being able to respond and being able to refer. We do keep the identity uh, confidential uh, unless they themselves make moves to be known in the community because it can be dangerous for them and there can be a lot of finger pointing. Um, so we increase their awareness around domestic violence, of course, the, uh, the, you know, um, the knowledge for referrals and, um, and increase their support networks. But they brought forward that they wanted to do uh, prevention activities and wanted to hold talks. So we then developed, of course, a PowerPoint that they can use and did some training around that. They also felt that they needed to work through the power holders. And this is always individual women making their decision uh, and that they, for example, would need to work together with their pastor and pastor priest uh, to make something happen. What's recently are, uh, emerged though is that they have a sense of helplessness, some of them, because the size of the problem is just so big in their community and they feel they're holding it on their shoulder. So, um, so they want to have the conversations, but also are a little bit scared of what the conversation might bring. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember. They have a fear of social exclusion for themselves. There's particularly a woman in Coffs Harbour that, um, that sort of says, look, if I go down this track too much, then I don't have community and, and I need my community. I need my culture. I need to be embraced by my culture. So it's a very, very hard thing for her to do. Um, and again, there is a huge shame altogether about domestic violence, but we also found that the victim survivor carries more shame because they're also being told what they could do and then they're not acting on it. And I'm sure that is something you experience as well in your work. Um, so yeah, supporting you is an amazing opportunity and we, we will try to keep that network and there's probably opportunities for you to engage with that network. Um, next slide, please. And I'm sorry, it might be a bit rushed. Um, this collaborative case management model is not necessarily designed for prevention, but it does, does have a flow on effect for that too. This is in the St. George area where several organizations come together to develop a, a model and a, a pathway to work together on with multicultural communities. And so they hold the cases together and the Migrant Resource Center, which is called Advanced Diversity, um, supports all the migrant stuff, social connection, visa issues, those kind of things, so that the DV service then can focus on DV only. They do warm referrals, they hold the person together, if the person doesn't want to be uh, working with the DV service, that's okay. Then the DV service provides the expertise to the Migrant Resource Center and vice versa. If the DV has a referral that they feel there's strong cultural elements, they inclu include the Migrant Resource Center to work with them. They've got a co common plan, common agreed timeframes to respond, common case management plan, common intake. So let's have a look how that panned out for prevention. Next slide, please. So uh, it, it lifted for a start, it lifted the competence of both organizations enormously. Both, um, you know, for the DV service, it's the multicultural space. For the multicultural service, it's the DV space. 
uh, both of them thought they were knowledgeable but knowledgeable but it actually made a huge difference and um, the migrant resource center runs women's groups so that was an opportunity uh, to bring in new topics that the dv service suggests because they they can see from their work what's going on uh, for some of the of the families and that this might be cultural which then the mrc picks up um, they do a lot of uh, building the capacity of other services, that's the Migrant Research Centre, so to be more uh, culturally competent. And they build gender equality now into many of the other information sessions as, as a topic. Very small, sometimes only pointers, uh, but it can make a big difference, particularly in women feeling confident to disclose at that place. And they do a lot of internal education to staff, which is something that SSI does all the time as well, because, of course, our staff are often culturally very bound themselves. As I said before, they feel sorry, they might find an excuse. Uh, it's very difficult to step out of your own culture. Thank you. Next one. And I'm sorry I'm talking at you a little bit, but I'm sure there will be opportunities for, for questions. So this now is, brings us to the orientation, because you might be wondering where do migrants, new migrants, learn about domestic violence and where do they learn around gender equality? So there is a booklet uh, that, um, oops, sorry, that's my own timer, trying to keep myself on track. Um, so the um, so there's a booklet where this poster is in it, for example, for low literacy. We do use it for our face-to-face -face orientation. It does have a gender equality aspect, which is num your number three uh, sort of picture, where you have the dean handing over to a woman her, her degree. Um, you know, degrees and education are very important in migrant communities, so it sort of shows that um, importance around women doing the same as men in this culture. Then, of course, you have a whole lot of domestic violence picture of various forms. Uh, and we work through that. But uh, orientation sessions are very early in the piece. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the booklet is called Beginning a Life in Australia, 128 pages, but it does have 35 languages. So that's the positive thing. It is very long and it does have a section on domestic violence. Um, and only refugees actually get that face-to-face -face session through our on arrival refugee programs. And it will be very hard sometimes to get other migrants to come to these sessions, but by and large, we are not funded to run them anywhere else. But we'd also have to say that in a way, they're too recently arrived to grasp the concepts fully. What they mostly take away is you are not allowed to hit and, and a lot of the other nuances would, would be lost, which of course also means you drive it on the ground to some degree, what is going on at home. Uh, and the education also means they're gonna be careful and they're gonna keep tight in their family home. So it, it is a, a two-edged sword in some ways. The community influence is incredibly strong. So they hear from the community, like you're gonna have your ch children taken away, uh, that kind of thing, um, if you're not careful. And, um, and so there's lots of threats, which makes it very hard to engage um, and makes it hard to involve police and so on. So many face authorities, though, soon after arrival sometimes because the neighbours might call the police or, and they, they might not know at all what they've done, done wrong. So, and it's uh, incredibly difficult when the whole system then comes down on, on them and possibly for good reason, but um, sorting that out for our case managers and 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 again you know walking the path of of support and the path of you're doing the wrong thing is is really quite hard and it's hard to convince everybody to come back for more sessions we know they should we know it would be better if we have that conversation three months down the track again but that is really hard because they're then you know, they're settling into getting the kids into school, into knowing where to go shopping, into knowing how to use public transport and all of that. So, um, you know, they want to get on with their life, which is fair enough. And so we increasing our focus on case managers to do better with those kind of conversations around gender equality and around domestic violence. And for that, we now have a domestic violence practice specialist at SSI. Thank you. Next slide. Nearly there, guys. Um, and I hope you, I don't talk at you too much. Uh, so there's a settlement consortium. So as I said, we lead 20 partners. 
And some of you might know that most recently settlement organizations received some funding for domestic violence related work. So this is to collaborate with DC DV services. This is not to replace DV services. But we do know that often women don't agree to go to DV service. So there's got to be somebody there that supports them and holds them, uh, but then uses the expertise of the DV service in the background. Um, so all settlement services provide some sort of relationship related groups or women's groups where they discuss health and well being, and they always include domestic violence, most often the Deleuze model. Uh, to sort of illustrate um, domestic violence in its various forms. Um, we lead a community of practice for settlement and domestic violence, and that's where we work through some of the issues and how they could approach it. And they all report um, that domestic violence and gender equality is one of the most critical issues for cult communities, but also a critical issue for them to grapple with, because it's, of course, um, if it happens, it is deep seated, and you all would know a lot about that. Uh, last slide, I think. Thank you. Okay, so the conversations then, the prevention conversations. We know that NCAS, you know, our migrant communities have, um, you know, a, a less favorable approach to gender equality than, um, than um, Australian communities at large. So we do know that the issues are there. We certainly do subscribe to the Our Watch framework around gender equality and knowing that really attitudinal change is, is what we're looking for. Um, but of course, it's an incredibly hard um, slog, as you can hear from what I'm saying. Um, so another thing around children and, you know, NAPCAN, that's important for you, is that really, and I fully understand that, and so would you, Migrants often want to children do for the children to just do well, which often means education. Um, they have come because for their children, most often. They often say that we've, you know, we finished with our lives, we've had our lives, but we want our children to do better. But they also the trauma that many of them experience, particularly refugee, they're hoping fiercely, fiercely, that the children are fine. And in their community, often the children just grows, grow up with the adults and, and children are just children. And there is an assumption that children don't take much on board and that they stay innocent and so on. So there's a huge denial about um, that, you know, children need to be considered. And, um, and we know it's really important and we try to make that um, part of the conversation all the time. Uh, as I said, culture is really deep seated, and I can see that somebody is talking about the CV in in the chat, and we'll have a look at that. Uh, what does gender equality look like? Look, we we do have to look at modelling, uh, because otherwise it's really a fearful concept. As as I said earlier, the loss of control, sense of loss of control, and they don't really know what that would mean on a daily basis around conversations with your wife, what are respectful conversations you could have? How could you cue into her thinking around gender equality? They just assume she's gonna run off and, and, and that's it, you know, they lose their control. So, so I think, you know, if you wanna have those conversations, they're really important, but think about how you can have good examples of what it could look like. And we all know that we haven't achieved it ourselves as a, as a whole group of Australian if you look at Australian society. And, um, and, and it's an ongoing piece of work for all of us. Um, and yes, ongoing conversations in the communities, absolutely. And we now, and you will see that in the plan, it's, it is community led. We need to have the community on site and we need to have that conversation from within, whether it's through the GPs, whether it's through the religious leader, whether it's through the social responder women, uh, we need to have it led from between, or it has from in between, it has no credibility otherwise. And uh, we need to empower women one step at a time. I think at the end, the change from within will also come from the women. Um, and that's it for now. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I hope it's not has, gave you a good overview. And we're absolutely happy to have further conversations. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so very much, Astrid. Um, I just love hearing about the work that you do. Like how impressive, huh, um, everybody? So look, we have like a stack of questions. Um, the first one I want to ask you though um, is around, it was really interesting we talked about how it's really difficult to support people who may be using violence and abuse and controlling behaviours in their relationship, um, but you also want to maintain engagement with them and you want to make sure that you're supporting them to change. So how do you kind of walk that line of supporting change without collusion, but maintaining engagement. And as part of that, um, and I, I know I've spoken to you about this before, but as part of that really around maintaining, a, a, I guess, a, a framework of compassion. Um, and I'm really interested to know around um, what you see as the key benefits of engaging with both partners in a safe way and, that, and, and what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. So as a program, yes, like other men's behavior program, we have a women's program. And we engage extensively with women because it's only if the women see the change and if they feel safer, then you have achieved something. Uh, so that's for one. The, the collusion issue is, is very interesting and we certainly have intense um, supervision, much more than other men's behaviour change program because we know it's so hard for our community facilitators who are bilingual and who are from the community and integrated in the community to to keep that sort of separation and so there's a lot of conversations um, so we we certainly work on keeping their passion but not providing excuses for domestic violence so um, and and not to become not to see them as enemy and I think that I mean that is something that all men's behavior programs grapple with um, mm -hmm. as to how the men try to achieve collusion. And we have had a couple of staff that we had to let go because they just couldn't do that bridge. And they also said, I'm feeling so much more comfortable to be a supportive person. I really find it hard to call them out because I can see where they're coming from culturally. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's intensive supervision is really the answer. Yeah, pretty, pretty high level stuff. Um, thank you. There's a lot of engagement, so I'm going to bear with me. I might have to summarise some of this. So um, <laughs> one of them says people are always interested in implementation. So what if other areas? So Well, first of all, there's a lot of people saying, where is this? Can we access this in other areas apart from Western Sydney? Like are there are other areas that Sediment Services International are doing this work? Um, can they access it in Queensland, for example? Um, and also what if other people in other areas would like to set something up, like supporting you as part of their community prevention strategies? Um, yeah, uh, look, we, we're absolutely happy um, to share the model. And um, we could talk to our Queensland counterpart there in Logan. They run the 99 Steps, which some of you might know, uh, which is a DV service basically, uh, particularly for refugees, but also for cult communities. Um, we do have funding for this. So, you know, talk to your funding bodies. I think that would be important. This is an innovation project in New South Wales from the COVID funding, because we knew under COVID it's even harder to have a conversation to someone. Uh, so it, it's really a response to that. But we're certainly happy to talk to whoever is interested of how we did it. Um, and, and yeah, if you have a little bit of funding, then that, that will be really useful. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Astrid. And I think um, just I've got a message here from Napcan to sort of suggest to anyone who's listening today as well that there will be a resource sheet and there'll be more resources um, and links to different um, referral points and resources there. So hopefully that will help. Um, what else we've got? Um, do you have a booklet in Kurdish? Uh, Kurumaji, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep, okay. And um, uh, yeah. Zidi refugee um, and yeah. does it include sexual assault and also just a, a shout out to say thank you so much for this great service it is so appreciated. Oh you're welcome so I, I will stay on of course for the whole webinar so I will find it whether they have it in Kumanji and whether it includes sex, sexual assault it's, it's on the website so I can also put a link in so that others can go and have a look at that booklet yeah I'll, I'll do that a bit further down the track yeah. I've and somebody just questions. put in accesscommunity.org 99 steps. Wonderful. Yes. Beautiful. And the, with the link there is fantastic. Yeah. 
Excellent. Um, I've got a couple more questions, but we might leave that for the Q and A at the end um, because we, yeah, just just because of time. Um, but it's an absolute delight. Thank you so much, um, Astrid, for for sharing with us um, all the amazing work that you and your team are doing. We really appreciate it. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to Chris Boyle. Chris is the founder and executive director of Stand By You Foundation. He is a social worker turned social entrepreneur who has been protecting children and helping families in need for over 25 years. Chris is passionate about prevention. You will see that um, beaming from him when you speak, when you hear him speak. Um, and he's also passionate about the importance of connecting community. Uh, today, uh, we will hear from Chris about his work, particularly about Magnolia Place which is a unique space set up by Stand By You at Helensvale, Westfield. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Hayley, and good morning, everyone. I'm coming to you from uh, Helensvale on the Gold Coast, which is the land of the Yangaba people. So um, I pay my respects and I thank my fellow presenters and NAPCAM for the opportunity. Uh, I think I should round out that I too am a father of two adolescent daughters, um, one who uh, has sent me to the valley in um, Brisbane here at 2 a.m. in the mornings to do pickups, and it's probably been about 25 years since I've done that. So um, I'm in my pajamas in the car, though, to save her some embarrassment. Um, welcome to Magnolia Place. I'm going to give you a bit of a tour around what exactly is Magnolia Place, but a bit about Stand By You Foundation. Um, our focus is very much on connections. We believe that through the mobilisation of family and friends. Uh, we will truly achieve prevention because um, it is that space in which we can play that uh, we believe that there's a bit of a void and they can hold hands to very important services and all of those other systems responses are really necessary. But let, let's bring you to where women often tell us is one of the safest places, if not the only safe place that they can ever access if they're experiencing violence with a little asterisk on our COVID restrictions for the past two years, and that is the shops. The shops never closed, and the shops is a space where we believe uh, we can truly do prevention. So I'm gonna take you on a bit of a tour of exactly um, what Magnolia Place is. So as you can see, we are not hidden. We are in the second busiest entrance here of Westfield Shopping Centre. Um, the car park is right out there. And here's our sign, it's right here. The important thing for before you get hurt is that you strategize. We truly believe that we can utilize this space as an access point for those who are seeking to find what supports and information might be available out there. But our strong view is we believe that um, women are more likely to access places like the shops the banks and the telcos um, before they will have to access the police, the courthouse and the refuges. So why not let's use some of these spaces to truly do some reach-ins and connections work. So here is our entrance, as you see, people might just come into this space and they often say, what is this all about? We've been mistaken for the Botox place that used to be here before us. Uh, we've been here since October last year and that's probably the only thing we can't support people in. But Everything else is greeted with a human experience. We have a little um, kids look here um, that families can see it. We've got the Xbox, we've got the TV on, we've got a bit of a private room here where we can have some more private conversations that um, legal services might use. Might be a need to ring up some specialist domestic violence services or housing, just need a bit of quiet space. And here we have our community desk. So. Uh, this is where we invite anyone in the community who is providing services, either a funded services, a volunteer group, anyone who wants to reach the people to meet the needs of the people in the community. And here we have where yours truly sits. Uh, fridge, coffee, Wi-Fi, everything is available to anyone who walks in. So I'm going to sit back down and try and recalibrate. Hopefully that, that tour went okay i couldn't really see the screen too well so um magnolia place has three core values um first is this is a human experience we understand that timing is absolutely everything 
when it comes to providing supports to those women and children and families who may be experiencing violence. So when they are ready, so too must we be. So it's a human experience. They walk in the door, it's eyes up on the door, and it is a question which is, do you want a tea? Do you want a coffee? Do you want a Coke or a water? Let's have a chat. We go over to the desk there. Or they might just want some information on some in services that might be available. Then we sit and have a chat and the second principle comes to life. It is, we need to be whatever you need us to be today, right now, in order for you to have a better tomorrow than today. So that is not just seeing things in the lens of domestic violence, because we often know that the shame uh, that's associated to that often prevents discussion points that might be relevant, but it might take you know, the form of mental health. It might take the form of homelessness. It might take the form of poverty, um, substance misuse. We have young people who come in here. We have um, financial counsellors who are coming in here. We have people who come straight from the bank or the GP or the telco who are referred here um, simply to try and unpack what it is that is troubling them. What is their challenge right now that we can believe a little bit of that. And third and probably the most important thing that we look to do uh, as a value is get shit done. People need to be able to see progress in their lives. And our hope is fuel, not fear. People don't need to be reminded about what fear is. These women, these children who live with this every single second of their day, um, don't need to be reminded about what it's like to not sleep or look over your shoulder, but they do need to be reminded about what hope looks like, uh, about connections. And I, I think we can all relate a little bit, just a little bit, um, to what life is like for those experiencing violence over the past two years. Social isolation, restriction of movement, inability to have that human bond, that human reach out, um, that impacts us, on us in ways that many of us have never felt. Uh, we feel that distance and I say that that's just a drop in the ocean for what people who have lived with violence for say 20 years have experienced. So when we reach in, we, we really have a, a, a requirement to feel the pulse of this community. And for those who don't know, the Gold Coast um, here, particularly the Northern End, is the domestic violence capital of Queensland. Um, Southport Courthouse, um, which is not far down the road, is the busiest courthouse, uh, certainly in Queensland for domestic violence related matters. Um, Kelly Wilkinson um, was murdered about five kilometres that way. Um, and look, we understand the burden on the system's responses, particularly the police, the courts, the escape routes for women um, are often overwhelmed and they're absolutely necessary, but so too is some diversion paths. And that's really the key focus of what we try to do here at Stand By You. We, we try to hold these women, these children very carefully in the space in which they've entered. We look to focus on connections and, and there's a framework that we have about that, but the connections is back to family and friends. The connections is also to those services that do amazing work for children, family, women, men across the community. Um, we have service partners who sit here um, every week. Uh, we have a bit of a roster, financial and counselling services, mental health, NDIS, housing, employment. Anyone who wants to see families in this space can use this space because getting to do home visits and, and the way services have had to augment particularly over the last two years. Um, this is a space where families already are. So let's reduce the burden on families to get to services, particularly if they have three kids that they need to get into public transport to travel 45 minutes to find out the caseworker's sick today, and then they have to return around. Let's just use this place and space as an access point to connect. And our framework for, you know, we've, we've seen since October that we've opened is over 700 direct walk-ins. We, we do not operate the case management model. Those days are over for me, and I'm really glad to say they're over for me because um, it's tough work, right? We all know the, the, the challenges in, in uh, doing case management. 
Uh, and I don't want to be inundated with that paperwork aspect either. Um, the benefit of not being funded is you get to do what you believe um, is right. Uh, the challenge is not being funded in order to afford to do uh, pay for the staff and, and pay for the brokerage that we support women with. 175 retailers operate in this centre alone um, and they are all part of the solution. Security that works here, the service desk, the cleaners, the concierge people, the retail management, the leasing groups. What we've seen in the past um, 14 months, or just over 12 months, is the eyes up approach. That they now have this ability to walk through the centre and see things that they otherwise might have ignored because I don't know what to do in that space. Um, certainly one of the conversations we had when we were proposing this partnership with Centre Group, who are the owners of Westfield, was a bit of a risk around bringing domestic violence into the shopping centres, to which we said, look around, it's already here. It, it is evident in every single store, it is evident in the staff who walk in here, it is evident at the food courts on weekends where there's family court handovers. So what we're actually bringing you is a solution to the problem that is present here. And we're doing it in a way which is really non-stigmatising. Um, we don't brand anything up that, that is going to be stigmatised to a walk-in space because we are so eclectic around what your needs are. But certainly with our 700 walk-ins, we've had about 85% of those have been female, about 12% have been male and about 3% non-binary. Issues that they do experience are those ones that we mentioned, the highest ranking ones are domestic violence and mental health issues, um, followed by NDIS issues, homelessness issues, financial counselling and support issues, unemployment. They seem to be what this community is telling us is their need. So our job is to then go and find those funded services to say, hey, would you like to work at this space and see those people or offer a service that we can promote? Um, but it's not simply just throwing a service in. You really have to change the hearts and minds of people to make it accessible, to make it incentivising. Uh, and Westfield, um, to their credit, we, we talked a bit about one of the early talks around that, a corporate social responsibility. And for their part, this space here um, would lease normally for about $90,000 a year. And there is no way that we could ever afford that. That would have just been off the card. So um, they've given it to us for a dollar a year, um, plus a two and a half percent increase every year. So I've got to find two cents, uh, rounded up to three. Um, but they also have a desire to expand this under the similar arrangement across their other sites. Um, our ask is within South East Queensland here at the moment, but certainly the, the CEO of uh, Centre Group, Peter Allen, who's visited here on many occasions, is looking to see how they can promote this type of um, support within all of their sites. And if we can't do it with bricks and mortar, we can certainly do it uh, via remote access like what we are doing right here, right now. Um, one of the things that we uh, look to do is deploy our Stand By You Shields, which is a um, framework in which we ask women as experts and children as experts in their life about all the things that they're currently doing right now that keeps them safe. Um, they are experts and their safety plan isn't on a form in a file. It's on their heads, it's in their hearts, it's what they live and breathe every day. Don't open the curtains, kids don't go to school. Uh, we don't go out but we do go to the shops and we do have to come back. Um, then we ask them about all those people who know about the things that keep them awake at night. And, and often they say there's not many because that shame and isolation that was spoken about is really heavily anchoring them down to reaching out. But then we guide them through about who, if they knew, would drop anything at any time, just as we, if we were to close our eyes for a moment, think about someone that we love and care for, that if they would reach out to us right now, there's no hesitation in dropping what we're doing and getting to them. Uh, that's what these women and children and families need from a preventative lens, where we don't have to wait for eligibility or backlogs of services. We just need families to mobilise to change contexts. And those families need awareness, they need the context, and they need permission. Um, and when we can tie all of that together, 
um, what we can deploy within 90 minutes. And we've done about 70 shields um, over the past 14 months right here at this desk, often within 90 minutes. So we, we give them a wearable device like this um, that allows them or like this, where if they might want it in their pockets or on their car keys, simply to press that when their heart starts to race that then uh, sends live audio in a conference room, one way or two way to their chosen responders. You share decision making, get location through uh, about where you are and I can hear what's happening and I know who you are and they can respond by mobilising. And if the shits hit the fan really quickly, they can escalate in call to emergency services. But what we find is if we see those clouds rolling on the horizon, this is a value piece for women and kids, uh, press it then because if I get to it at an antecedent, then I change the behaviour and therefore I change the consequences. So from a truly preventative lens, we can do that by changing contexts very quickly. And then coming back to the closure of connections, we say, is there any hesitation you could think of that you would pause to press this when your heart starts to race a little bit faster? And then they can leave and then they can go on with their lives. And some women we see um, every single day, sometimes twice a day, where the only thing they need is a human experience and a, a coffee. Others we will never see again because they've got what they've needed from this place. Uh, lots of referrals from across the community that comes in and works with us, really just trying to turn that soil and expand this offering to other communities across not only Queensland but Australia. But I'm going to stop there and, and close up and uh, thank you all for your um, attention. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, how absolutely wonderful. It's just uh, so great to hear what's happening there at the centre. And I think for everyone as well, like well done to NAPCAN for bringing together, like right across the spectrum from like the um, prevention, really like very much a prevention focused program, the early intervention, and now we're seeing that tertiary crisis response and how best to do that. Um, there are lots of questions, but I'm gonna give you the feedback first. Um, well, what a fantastic idea, this is from the, from the audience. Um, well done, such a clever, accessible strategy, bringing the service to a place that is more familiar and doesn't raise suspicion, I'm just going to the shops. Um, I love that um, everyone in the shopping center is involved. Chris Boyle, I salute you. So that's a bit of feedback from the, <laughs> from the audience. Um, I guess what I was going to say, oh, you know, and also I think it was really lovely to see the space, like, and that's the thing, like if you see somebody and you feel comfortable with them, um, and then if you see the space, I think it makes it um, so much more accessible than kind of the whole idea of accessing a service. So I think that's really nice. Um, I yeah. love what you said about the human experience. Um, and, you know, really what you were describing was very much a trauma informed um, client centred approach. And I think, you um, that's really, I mean, absolutely at the heart of it. And, and you know, so I guess one of the questions I was going to have is uh, for you that I thought the audience might be interested in um, is how important is the first response um, that someone gets, um, whoever, whether it's your service like yours or anyone else, that first uh, response and what tips would you give people as to the way that they can respond compassionately and be a tellable person, if you will? Yeah, no, a really good question, Hayley, and, and thank you everyone for the, the feedback there. It is probably the most critical touch point, that, that very first response of um, what we talk about when we define what safety is, it, it's being seen, it's being heard, it's being believed, you know. Um, when we often hear from women around their experiences with touch points on services, there's not a value piece about this, but it's really important for any of us providing services from a prevention lens that this is a wonderful opportunity to give them a choice and maintain control in their life. Um, we have many women who might be sent to us from Southport or Coomera Police that they just say go directly to, to Magnolia Place and they come in with their manila folders full of orders and evidence, right? And we just say, put that away. Put that away. You know, you you are an expert in your life. Your job is not to convince me of your eligibility for something that's accessible here. Um, I just want to ask you one question that only you and the world can answer. Um, do you ever feel unsafe with him? Yes. That's it. Don't worry about anything else. I believe you. I hear you. I see you. Um, what we really want to do, and that whole thing, we, as if we were in a the same space of each other, right? 
we're all human services people. We, we share conversations over tea, over coffee, over food. Um, by offering that, it's an acknowledgement of value as well. You know, that you're welcome. We've got some very regular people who will just go to the fridge and help themselves, which is wonderful. Um, last week, I had 15 people buzzing in and out here and um, regular people making coffees or teas for new visitors. You know, this is about, I, I don't see myself, my name's on the lease for this, but I'm not the owner of this. The community is the owner of this. And when you can embed all of that into a place, then it grows from a true community development mindset. And that is what people want to be a part of. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And when we can provide tangible, immediate solutions that come from a value base, that very first point of contact, makes people really disarmed and makes them open to going on that journey um, with whoever that might be. Mm. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And I think what would resonate with a lot of us is, is that you're talking about making sure they have choice, making sure they have control. Um, and we, as we know, the very heart of gender-based violence is that um, it's about taking of that control. So if we can be so mindful yes. of that, as, as you've described, I think we're onto something. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other question that's um, here is around community and corporates and the fact that the, that the community more broadly and corporates are playing a greater role. Um, and I guess some of the questions um, for the audience as well is, you know, how can others be encouraged to follow suit? You mentioned that perhaps in that whole chain of um, shopping centres that there is interest. Mm -hmm. And I guess how yeah. um, should frontline specialist domestic and family and sexual violence services approach a shopping centre for this kind of assistance? Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, one of our experiences here is the first part of a space like a shopping centre is the people who work here every single day and they themselves are experiencing these things that we see people who come to our services for. So it's really important to, they wear many hats. They wear the hats of an employee or an employer as well as someone who lives in the community, you know, who might be experiencing this. So when you go and approach them as either wearing one of those hats, you know, that it's just providing that information and awareness. I think some of the challenges for us in this space who um, we often say corporates need to do more and that's not quite true because corporates need to look after their shareholders. Um, what we want is corporates to do more and they want to do more. And it's up to us to articulate the role that we see them in playing. And one of the things for any service to, you know, to really grapple with is provide them opportunities to go on the journey with you. Volunteer, lean in, be part of the stories that come back that says what impact looks like. Some people love numbers, um, others love stories. Cater to all audiences, right? Because when a, when a corporate like Westfield Centre Group puts their, you know, name to your brand, um, it has to resonate with what they're, department sees and, and for Westfield it's enriching and connecting communities and for mm. us it's connections change lives right yeah so seeing these as pure access points um we don't need them to go on the journey of the wonderful work that we all do as specialists who've got expertise in our fields we need them to be an access point to provide a referral or deviation pathway so make it simple make it tangible make it part of a journey and that's where you see them really lean in would be my advice. Great advice. Uh, we here at Full Stop Australia also engage a lot with corporates and a lot of, and, and what you're saying around pretty much a relationship, that you're having a relationship and that they can see their part in that relationship and that journey. Um, just uh, You just hit the nail on the head. So thank you so much for that. Um, I've got yes. one more question here and then I'm gonna bring um, Astrid back in as well. The question's actually about the technology, technology mm -hmm. device um, solution. Um, so uh, yep. you've had, the question is from the audience says, Chris, um, have you had any experiences where the watch was detected by a perpetrator and escalated the situation or prevented future help seeking? Yeah, we, we have had zero, we've deployed about 800 of these uh, over the past couple of years. We've had zero um, accounts of harm done as a result of because the technology is the third and final aspect that the real solution sits with the people and the plan, right? Um, the technology aspects, is, and when we start with women in the framework about tell us everything you're doing now that keeps you and your kids safe, because it's gotten to this point. Everything that they still have available to them, you know, that they've been doing before remains consistent. They don't stop doing this. 
Um, but it's that connections piece. When we reach out and say, who knows, who cares, and provide those scenario-based trainings, the choice of taking the device or the type of device remains with women and kids as experts about how they frame that. Some choose to leave it as covert. So I, I want this and I want it in my pocket or I want it in my bra or I just want to be able to press that without anyone knowing. Others prefer the absolute overt. I want him to know that his behaviours like a speed camera are going to change, not because he knows what he is doing is not right, but he's going to get caught, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we can use situational crime prevention. So we talk a lot about how other women may have used this, but ultimately it's up to the woman who's sitting across from us as an expert in her life about how she would introduce this. Um, some say, look, it's just my step counter, right? I can count my steps and my calories. You know, um, some say it's just a gift, you know, our work are doing something, you know. Others will just say, um, look, it's it's just, um, you know, my absolute safety watch and I want you to know and give us feedback that my threats to him to call police for 20 years have never been effective because he goes, bring it on. They'll believe me, they won't believe you. I have power and authority. Now yeah. she gives us feedback that says, I go to press this, he stops. Why? Because the context will be changed and it's people that he has to see and are accountable to. And, and I noticed that, you know, often when we talk about men and behaviour change, that's a really long burn, right? Behaviour change is hard. If it's easy, I'm 10 kilos lighter, right? So behaviour change is great. That's the journey we want to put people on, but it's not the same as safety responses. Safety responses are about immediacy. And when we have personal responsibility for men who use violence, people who use violence, coupled with shared accountability from the network of people who know and care, and it may be the paternal side. You know, paternal grandmother doesn't want her grandchildren harmed. She doesn't want to keep bailing him out from the watch house as her only mechanism of support. Give them what their role is in the response through the plan. And then we find that, you know, the more over the plan is perhaps the better it is because we've got more people who are providing social surveillance and monitoring and support. It's really isolation which we are trying to um, you know overcome and connections are the cure. Mm. Thanks so much actually we've got Astrid here now as well and I've got to uh, give my apologies for Marika she had to duck off literally to go and do some training um, so which is fantastic but um, I was going to ask as you, Astrid, about that as well. How important is that accountability piece um, in the work that you're doing um, with people who might be using abusive or controlling behaviours in their relationship? Um, and how do you, in that context, given everything you said about, um, I guess, you know, more set views and uh, that are culturally informed around gender roles and expectations and those sorts of things, so how do you balance the accountability piece with, I guess, the public shaming um, and the risk of disengagement? Mm. Um, so this particularly applies to the men's behaviour, uh, you know, uh, change program. Um, yeah, we absolutely hold them accountable in the, uh, in the group. Um, but we also, they also know that uh, we talk to the women. So they actually have to agree um, that we talk to their partners and that their partners are involved. Um, otherwise, the, the risk is, of course, higher because what they might have learned in the group or come across in the group and the challenges um, to, the, to their behaviour and, and holding them accountable might directly have an impact when they go home. Mm. So they do, as a safety measure, they do that. They know that we work with the women and that their success also relates to the women. I have to say what, what our men appreciate the most is uh, learning about self-regulation and it's almost like Chris said with, with his watch um, that is the number one that they themselves report has made a big difference in that they learn to walk away or they learn the early signs when they are escalating so the physical you know uh, 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 sort of tension and fidgetiness and, and however it manifests for them and and they and they um, you know, they, they say they practice it, even on the train station or in the car with road rage or all sorts of things, they practice it. And we have a particular exercise that they just feel works for them. And it's the um, the little glass container with the volcano, you know, the thing that you shake 
or the kids use that then all of a sudden rises and then blows up. And they use that sort of as a prop to be able to talk about their rise, rising anger and when it happens and what it happens and what triggers it and what they could do in response. And they do do a bit of mindfulness training for that too, which not everybody culturally sort of can relate to, but they learn their own, own strategies and talking them through. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing from you is just that really important, um, the fact that it's a range of things and it's not like Chris said, it's not, you know, the longer term behaviour change, it does feed into behaviour change, but that, that, you know, that learning those skills around regulation and those sorts of things is about a safety strategy. You know, it's not going to necessarily challenge those deeply ingrained views as to why, and those value systems as to why someone feels they're entitled to behave that way. Um, but it's really, really important as part of that safety strategy and trying to relearn um, how we actually address conflict, how we actually um, learn to get our needs met in a way that's safe. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's a really important um, reflection actually. Um, a question as well from the audience is um, and probably both of you actually, but I'll start with Chris. What about men who are victims of domestic violence? Are they able to come to that Magnolia place? And I guess um, the question that might be coming and I've come from, um, worked in specialist women's services and around the need for safe space for women um, as well. So I'm really keen to know your thoughts on that and had you know have things changed. Um, but yeah, yeah. What, what about um, men who are victims of domestic violence? Yeah, th this is absolutely an all-inclusive place and space and, and the same framework in which we engage children, young people and women is exactly the same framework in which we engage men. Um, give you an example of um, it's all about opportunities and timing and, and uh, one of the contractors who came in here to check our emergency lightings you know was here with his clipboard and, and he's walking and he's like what's this place all about as we gave him the blurb about what we do anyone who's experiencing challenges isolation risk of abuse yeah sit down tea coffee chat let's think about how we can connect you and the little tears started to well in his eyes and and I said to him would you like a tea or a coffee you know want to, want to sit down and he gave a half a second pause and he's like actually i will oh, yeah um we did we sat half a box of tissues him venting he's never going to be a man who would access a service you know to call up around that there but he sat and spoke about his recent separation from his partner of 20 years and kids he knows he's not being the best version of himself he says i'm not being violent but i'm being an asshole and i don't want to be an asshole and, and i want to stop this because I, I don't want to ruin my relationship with my ex-partner and my kids fantastic who knows about those things that worry you who knows about those things that creep up on you uh well i've become closer with my dad and my brother you know more recently okay would they be people who would you know, scaffold you, be on your team, want you to be the best version of yourself. Yes, yeah, okay, let's reach out to them. Let, let's have a chat with them. Let's have this open dialogue with them now because most of the time when we reach back in, they have been worried themselves, but they've never been know what to say or when to say it or how to say it in risk of losing that relationship. But that permission aspect allows them to lean in and then they've got some scaffolding around them as they walk out. So what we know in this sector, particularly domestic violence, is men become invisible very quickly. And it's important that we don't make them invisible because that actually increases the risks and, and the dangers to women and, and to kids. We want to bring them in really closely because when we can see them and connect them, then we're going to get a better outcome for the women and kids as well. You know, So it's a real all-inclusive has to be wraparound service that just sits in and values that human experience. Yeah, and, and I guess the other question that's come in here from the audience is saying mm -hmm. um, that they're curious about what um, your strategy is when perpetrators or men's rights representatives come into the space. Um, how do you manage that kind of confrontation? But also, I guess, on a, in a more, perhaps even more nuanced point, um, and I know from my work in Frontline, uh, working in this space and part of um, the establishment of the Safer Pathway program, it's an integrated program. You've got one similar in Queensland, uh, where police and agents, everybody comes together as an integrated approach. We would see um, quite a number of male, of people who were identified as male victims. Um, and then by the time they'd come and everybody would 
sit around the table and share information, um, they would actually find that there was quite a lot of past history of their offending behaviour. Um, but yeah. they very, very much, and, and of course, um, I, I've worked in the men's behaviour chamber space as well, yeah. and this is the same, the fellows that are sitting around the yeah. room really identifying yeah. as the victim. So I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, how do you approach that um, situation? Yeah, we, we, we often go in with that sense of, oh, I don't need the whole story. Right? People, we've got very small moments in time to provide options and opportunities for others to come and pick them up and take them on that journey. And often that's the informal support networks as well as the formal. So we're very conscious around men manipulating systems and stories to somehow tag themselves in as a victim in perhaps some of these contexts there. But when we look to provide that same framework of connecting them back to people, that that uh, we have had an incident of one of the men sort of groups coming in and, and looking to us. It, it's important that we listen and, and listen respectfully, but we don't have to agree. You know, mm -hmm. um, moments to challenge on these. Um, if that's what we feel that would benefit them on this space there, that respectful challenging and options. But what we hear is, you know, painful people are full of pain. And I'd much rather get them to channel that in a very safe and, and supportive way through those services or touch points or those family members than them to build that up and end up murdering some woman, you know, every nine days there. So it's important that we all treat every engagement with respect. Having worked in child protection for 16 years, you get a lot of shackles, you get a lot of yelling, but what you can do when you sit very calmly and, and unpack that is really understand what their pain points are and try to connect them equally. We, we truly believe, whether it's men, women, children, young people, that relationships are the single most important factor to a healthy and happy life. That's what research tells us. Yeah. And there's someone out there for this person that we just need to find who they are to connect them, to make them the best version. So um, we, we, we've got devices ourselves that we can obviously connect to security here at Westfield, you know, um, if the danger stuff appears like we see in our workplaces there but often it's the skill of the practitioner who sits there and, and just listens and disarms and, and treats people with respect. Mm. Thanks so much Chris. Um, I think we have one more to, uh, chance for one more. Can I just, can I just answer yeah, it too quickly? Yeah, absolutely, I was going to oh. say you've been nodding along and I'd love to hear your thoughts and reflections on that as well but also if you if you may be very clever and also weave in um, your, what you think from your experience in this work Astrid um, makes the most difference in actually progressing gender equality in, in settlement communities and so those those as a driver um, so if you could we could hear that as well from you that'd be wonderful okay um, so just just to the, the victim question of course our programs are not in that sense available um, to if if the woman was the abuser which we know underlying um, you know tensions often show a different picture once you unpack it all um, as Chris was saying, but we do very much uh, get the victim kind of, I'm the victim here because Australia is doing this, Australia is doing that, and I didn't understand this, and I didn't understand that. So we, um, our men's behaviour change program starts off with the settlement experience because it has to be acknowledged. It's tough, it's traumatic, it doesn't matter how you can come, the change is incredible, and it's very emotional. So we try to get that out of the system and we also um, have this session around the cultural uh, sort of curve and how you keep falling back into it how you you're positive then you something happens and you fall back into your old patterns and so on and so on not about the dv but just so understanding how culture operates on you and 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 that sort of thing so we try to go right away from saying no 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 let's not look at that victim thing let's look at your experience and then move on to what we really want to do here um as in in what works um well it's a very very tricky one but at the end i think um women empowerment at the end works because they are also the one that care for children that make little steps and I, we're absolutely also like chris said about agency so often she wants to stay in the relationship what most often happens is she comes and says i want him to change can you tell him to change? Because you're in a, you're Australian, you can say that in Australia it doesn't happen and so on. And of course we can't make somebody change that doesn't want to change. But to give her agency in having very small controls over her life, even if it is a safety planning 
or if it's carving out time with her friends or whatever small thing it is, she feels empowered to be an agent in her own life. And that makes a lot of difference. For uh, in a broader sense in the community, it's often the women that drive the change with their women's groups or with their, you know, having supporting friends that say, look, let's do this, let's do that. Not the ones that say, oh, I would have long left him. You know, that is not very useful. But in terms of saying, oh, our, our community is suffering, oh, we we'll take charge for our community. And then they have those little conversations with their friends and the other people. And eventually, if there's enough of that going on, then the leaders will also step up because they will approach the leaders and say, you have to do something. You're our leader, supposedly. That, that is the absolute best note to end on um, and it's about that critical mass isn't it um, and supporting and empowering women and girls as well and I know that's a huge focus of your work. Um, thank you so very much to our wonderful panellists. Of course Marie Contellis has already left us but also Chris Boyle, um, Astrid Perry. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to have heard about the work that you're doing. I just wanted to also thank NAPCAN for your incredible organisation of throwing this together for us all. Um, we're, you know, it's been a really fabulous conversation today. For any, everyone who uh, joined us today, thank you so very much for engaging with this. Um, let's all in, um, continue the conversation. Please reach out to NAPCAN, to Stand By You, to Settlement Services International, to Full Stop Australia, to any of our agencies. We'll also be sending you a link to the web webinar recording. Um, and we'll also, alongside that uh, recording, uh, send out that resource sheet that I talked about with all of the links to the topic. Um, thanks again for engaging in 16 You're days welcome. of activism. Thanks for showing up. Sorry, somebody reaching? Suzanne, thank you. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to continuing uh, this journey alongside each of you to put a full stop to sexual, domestic, and family violence. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.